There is no better way to kick off Halloween weekend and celebrate my birthday than with a live show in our hometown of Dallas, Texas. For one night only on October 27th, we are presenting a special live show at the iconic Texas Theater in Dallas, Texas. It's our last Sinisterhood live show of 2022, so don't miss it. If you can't make it to Dallas, you can still join in on all the creepy fun from wherever you are through our worldwide digital experience in collaboration with Moment. No matter where you are, you can still attend our live show, and you can watch an on-demand replay after the event if you can't attend live. For more information and to purchase tickets for both the in-person event at the Texas Theater and our worldwide digital experience in collaboration with Moment, visit Sinisterhood.com slash live shows. See you on October 27th. A small town on a long stretch of highway in the bayou, its residents in the grips of poverty and addiction. When several women go missing and are found dead in a short span of time, their families want answers. But it seems like whoever is responsible for their murders has friends in high places. This week's episode is The Jeff Davis Eight. Part 1 A bump in the night Your heart fills with dread Probably a murderer Who wants you dead It could be a ghost A demon or worse Perhaps you're the victim of a witch's curse It's hopeless You're doomed You'd call a priest if you could You'd rather just listen to Who Sinister Who Another episode chosen by our patrons in the getting into it here. So thank you so much for voting on this one. This is a pretty disturbing and uh, still unsolved case of eight murders of women taken far too soon in a very rural part of Louisiana. These are the type of cases that really stick with us for a while and I'm already I'm halfway through murder in the bayou on Showtime and I can't stop thinking about it. Yeah, this is definitely this was one that several people have sent in via our submission form and when we were, you know, going for votes for this time, this is one that is still unsolved. It has uh victims who don't often have a voice in traditional media. Thankfully, Ethan Brown, who is the investigative reporter, kind of took up this mantle about a decade ago and has made it, you know, one of his, I mean, he wrote a book about it. The book was adapted to a Showtime series. But even with the release of that Showtime series in 2019, you think if this is one of these women is your loved one, your sister, your daughter, your mom, you think, okay, finally, okay, it's on this national platform. We're going to see some movement. And I think what was compelling for us and why we appreciate everyone who sent it in and our patrons for voting on it is that despite that attention there still was not movement really in the case there was another investigation discovery special that came out around the same time but after that it's kind of you know every once in a while they'll still put out a statement the police will still put out a statement and say oh it's still an open case it's an active case but when you dig down into what happened and the major players who at the very least were incredibly incompetent and most likely were very corrupt are not only still in law enforcement, but have risen in the ranks and mm-hmm. simply either moved locations or now are in more powerful positions at the state level. It is definitely something I think that we can, as to the extent our platform can bring attention to it, bring attention to something where otherwise I think the perpetrator of these murders kind of thought, oh, well, they're kind of on the fringe of society. No one will notice. They're, you know, women who have substance use issues have engaged in sex work, women of color, women of modest means. They think, ah, well, you know, no one's really going to complain. When in reality, they're very loved by their families. They're, they have extremely passionate and dedicated family members. And so I think whatever attention we can help bring mm-hmm. to it um, would hopefully be helpful. And like you said, it's one that's definitely sticking with us and I, I mean, it's to the this much like with the Ray Rivera case when something's unsolved. I now have my notebook that's got I have these like webs. <laughs> I have where some I'm theories. Like, I think there's a reason we haven't seen any more uh, deaths because sometimes when the person responsible for stuff dies off, then the deaths they were responsible for stop happening as well. But I think right? there's there's a lot of. Uh, Corruption and seedy things involved in this one. And watching the Showtime series, the stark difference between the north side and south side of this small town 
what did we say in the last Freaky Friday? Someone said they're about as similar as peaches and beans. Yes. That's that's this. Because North Jennings, uh, nice. mansions. You, yeah. I mean, huge homes, sprawling lawns, gorgeous landscaping, you know. And then you get literally on the other side of the tracks. And it is just poverty, no jobs, uh, rampant drug use, you know, lots of crime. So... It's really a town divided in many, many ways. And then, as we've seen so often with that, the law enforcement tends to care about one side more than the other. And, you know, uh, does there's, does there stuff to appease them, even if it means we might not be finding a killer or helping these women, but at least we've we've appeased the, the richies of the town. Yeah. The taxpayers and also mm-hmm. and the ones that are hopeful. Well, the, they're taxpayers too. Just because you're poor doesn't mean you pay taxes. Larger amounts of taxpayers mm-hmm. and also donors to campaigns because a lot of these positions are elected positions. And so you think, oh, well, oh, yeah, I, sh- I got to keep this side of the, the tracks clean because of this. Also, we'll see a significant amount of possibly putting your hands in the cookie jar of either narcotics or cash recovered from narcotics. So when you have a significant material like that, that's just worth thousands and thousands of dollars sitting in a room with the padlock on it, it ain't too hard to go and, you know, crack the code of the padlock and walk out of the evidence Mm -hmm. room with it. So I think we'll see that all throughout this, but a lot of, a lot of just women who I think the news, when I was going back through old newspaper articles and the not all local news but some more regional news going uh eight prostitutes were dumped mm-hmm. and just the language used around mm-hmm. it of like they were all crackhead prostitutes yeah. and it's like jesus christ this was somebody's sister somebody's yeah. mom and so i think the that's one good thing that the Showtime series did and hopefully will do through just our research and listening to interviews with family members, give you all a holistic picture of someone, mm-hmm. like you always say, beyond just the worst thing that's ever happened to them. Yeah, they were definitely reduced in the media to not even, you know, their names, just no. like you said, crackhead. And someone isn't a crackhead. They might be a person that struggles with substance abuse and their drug of choice is crack, but they're much more than just a crackhead. Mm-hmm. So to label someone and do blanket statements like this is their sole identity diminishes them and it's disrespectful and it's dishonoring. And so we hope that, like you just said, we bring you a better, a more well-rounded picture of, yes, These women struggled with many things, but they were much more than that. And regardless of what you're going through, no one deserves to end up face down in a canal full of crawdads and alligators. Certainly. Backwoods, Louisiana is a different country, man. They were doing a lot of aerial shots and footage I was watching, and I was like, there's so many things lurking the swamp in the bayou. That was one of my biggest fears. And I, of course, living in Louisiana was very foolish of me to move to a place where I'm just... Uh, deathly afraid of the swamp. I felt like there's just so much in them, and they're oh, thick. It's, it's water, but thick. Yeah, I hate it. Yeah. So thick, wa- thick, gross, dirty water with shit in it that can kill you. Yes. Why would anybody want to be near that? Yeah, it's. Uh, I mean, it's one of those. You and a lot of folks in this town, I think, were their lifelong residents that mm-hmm. lived there. Some of them moved in, you know, because family lived there. But you'll see. There's a lot of same last names oh, or gosh. maiden name, mm-hmm. last name, where there's five or six family, big families. And they said, oh, when you run into somebody in town, you're like, oh, OK, yeah. Is that your cousin? Oh, mm-hmm. yeah, I know them. Everybody's related. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yep. Yep. Well, I'm Christy. I'm Heather. And let's get into it. Jennings, Louisiana, located in Jefferson Davis Parish, is a small town of around 10,000 residents in southern Louisiana. Established in 1888, Jennings' economy is largely tied to agriculture and oil, with rice and soybean farmers and cattle ranchers being staples of the area. Located on Interstate 10 between the major importing hub of Houston and bustling New Orleans, Jennings finds itself smack in the middle of the two metro areas. Unfortunately for the citizens of Jennings, the primary materials smuggled along I-10 are illegal drugs, and those substances seem to have infested a large swath of the town's population. Yeah, I guess a lot of drug smugglers internationally enter through Houston, whether through the waterways or through planes, and then divvy it up and have people driving it either due east to New Orleans or up north on the I-45 corridor up through Dallas, actually, and up farther into that into Oklahoma. And so you see if they're 
if there's a way to stop people and make a little money, which is what they were doing, the civil asset forfeiture is a uh, where if the police suspect that items have been used in a crime, Jennings was on Dateline because they were doing this. That as soon as a certain sheriff got elected, he's like, just start pulling people over. And then it's just taking money, taking cars, taking anything that they quote suspected that could be used in a, that could have been used in a crime. Turns out a lot of it wasn't. A lot of it was just uh, black and brown people driving mm -hmm. or not even speeding. They were pulled over for nothing. Yeah. They did like hidden camera uh, stings on the officers and found out they were essentially robbing people. And this was like a huge. I remember when the news came out because a friend of mine was like, what what is this? I said, yeah, it's civil asset forfeit. They just take your stuff and it's mm -hmm. fine. It's legal. Yeah. What, what are you going to do? Call yeah. the cops when they're the ones they doing it? Yeah, they got guns. So that was definitely in East Texas and in Louisiana was a huge like sting bus that went through. So in addition to the townsfolk, their whole economy is agriculture and oil, which is flip flop, flip flop. Yeah. I mean, if, and if your whole economy relies on that in addition to drugs, then, you know, when it's good, it's good. But when it's bad, everybody is suffering and mm -hmm. drugs bring in some money, but it brings in a whole other mess of problems. And in the Murder in the Bayou series on Showtime, I think everybody that they interview, except for the sheriff, openly speaks about drug issues and, mm -hmm. you know, uh, and that their loved ones were on drugs. I mean... It seemed like it was harder to find someone that hadn't been affected by drug use than it would be to find someone that it, it hadn't ever affected them. Yeah, like you said, if it wasn't someone directly speaking about their own struggles, then it was a loved one, relative, mm -hmm. family member going, yeah, you know, both my kids are like, I did it and then I got clean, but then my kids start, you know, and it's so hard to hear that it started early with a lot of these folks yeah. where they all started smoking and drinking at 12, 13, and then it, it accelerated from there. Specifically, meth and crack were mm -hmm. our big players, yes. Running through the middle of Jennings is a railroad track that divides the town in more ways than one. North of the train tracks, the property values are much higher than the areas in its southern counterpart. On the docuseries Murder in the Bayou, one South Jennings resident named Jessica described the difference between the north and south side. North side's more like upper class snobs. The south side is the fucking ghetto. The area is rampant with drug dealing and sex work, with apparent indifference from police, as evidence from the lack of their presence in areas of known dealing and solicitation. Echoing this sentiment, Jessica told filmmakers, Cops look at the South Side like trash, like we don't matter. And in uh, the there's an investigation discovery series that interviews Whitney Dubois' family, and they two of her sisters run this, uh, it's like a laundromat thing, and they just point to the parking lot and they say, oh yeah, drug dealing just goes on out here. We mm -hmm. see solicitation out in front of us. They run their you know legitimate laundromat business, but it is because they're on the South Side, they know it's sort of a fact of life that mm -hmm. if you say, oh, well, I saw people dealing drugs in the parking lot of my business, I'll call the police. Like, it's like- and? They're not going to come. Yeah, yeah if you called 911, they just here. wouldn't come. You've Then mm -hmm. you've just taught that whole swath of the town. Nobody's coming. Well, and in a small town like that and with, you know, nefarious things happening, it's scary to call the cops. Mm -hmm. Everybody knows everybody. And we'll see one player in particular kind of ran the town and it's seedy things. So if you piss that person off, you're like, well, uh, I don't want to die. So I'm not going to call and rat somebody out. I'm just going to let it let it go on and kind of turn my head the other way. Or in some cases, the police officers were working in concert with the drug dealers and getting mm -hmm. a cut. And so then you've just ratted them to themselves, you know, to someone that's you're screwing the cops Either out of Either way, you're fucked because yeah, you somebody can't. You just can't. that is uh, doing dirty deeds knows mm -hmm. that you're the one that snitched and then now your life is in jeopardy. Certainly. That indifference was further proven when a fisherman made a grim discovery on May 20th, 2005, a body floating in a canal on the outskirts of town. When authorities recovered the body, it was badly decomposed and waterlogged. Eventually, they identified the remains as 28-year-old Loretta Lynn Shashan Lewis, described by her family as a loving mother, wife, and daughter who loved to help anyone she could. Loretta had gone missing a few days earlier. Disturbingly, she had given her purse to a friend the last time they spoke and asked that friend to secure its contents in case anything should happen to Loretta. 
because she struggled with substance use issues and sometimes engaged in sex work, her death was not highlighted much by the media or considered particularly alarming by authorities. Her family, however, was devastated and wanted answers. The death certificate listed the cause of Loretta's death as undetermined. However, the toxicology report showed high amounts of drugs and alcohol in her system. Still, this didn't explain how Loretta's body ended up in the drainage canal. Sadly, only Loretta's friends and family seemed bothered by this. And that's when you see a victim who general society, whether it be the media or whatever, wants to write off as on the fringe and tell yourself, that could never be me because I don't do crack or I don't smoke or I don't whatever. And in this case, we see this is the first in a long line of if you would have taken it seriously, what could you have stopped? Mm -hmm. Just six miles away from where Loretta's body had been found, and a few weeks later, on June 17th, 2005, A group of froggers out night frogging were taken aback by an overwhelming stench. As they got closer to its source, they saw it was another body. Lying in the swamp were the remains of Ernestine Marie Daniels Patterson, 30 years old. Ernestine's cause of death was immediately ruled a homicide, as evidenced by the incised wounds on her throat. Due to severe decomposition, it took the coroner's office two months to officially identify Ernestine. At the time, with two bodies found in a short time span and in close proximity to each other, Jeff Davis Parish Sheriff Ricky Edwards assured the town there was no serial killer and nothing to fear. Months later, in December of 2005, based on witness statements, two men were arrested for Ernestine's murder, Lawrence Nixon and Byron Chad Jones. However, they were released six months later when the district attorney's office determined it did not have sufficient evidence to proceed. The initial witness had recanted, and other witnesses came forward with conflicting stories. In the Showtime series, Murder in the Bayou, Ernestine's mother expressed her frustration with the sheriff's department and their investigation. I feel like they don't care. They they don't care. I have no closure, no peace. I can't rest at night. I have no closure, no peace. And what really happened was, you know, there was this porch with uh, where someone had reported seeing a, these two gentlemen with a black large garbage bag with blood coming out of it that they drug it to this the one of their homes and then had it on the porch and a, a third person said yeah they had this big bag it was bloody it bled all over the porch they picked it up and then they took it away and i don't know what happened and then 15 months later police tested the porch for blood and goes well there's no blood here <laughs> 15, yeah, over 15 a year months later. later. Yeah, 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 yeah. I imagine there's not. It probably has rained many times since yeah. then or somebody cleaned it up or whatever. Yeah. The interviews with the family in the Showtime series, specifically the parents, are just heartbreaking. And Ernestine is just devastated. I mean, they all are. Oh, her mom. Because – Even though the media paints these women as they offer nothing to society, in fact, they're a drain on it, these are someone's mom, someone's daughter, someone's sister, and no matter what choices they've made in life or things that were done to them that affected how their lives were lived, they were loved by their families and very missed, and people are people. Emotions are emotions. Like... Murder, it doesn't hurt less if you're rich or poor or hurt more. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. So you you find out your daughter has been lying face down, getting eaten by stuff for months in a drainage canal. How how do you ever get past that? And then when the cops are like, well, you know, she did a lot of drugs and engaged in sex work. So it was probably just the lifestyle she lived. What do you do? Yeah, and you and what really got me about the interview with Ernestine's mom and dad is that he the, that she her her mother was holding this photograph of her and it's you know maybe five by seven and it it's her driver's license photo mm-hmm. and it's a jagged edge around the edge and it's ripped off of this large poster and she said this is the only photo I have mm-hmm. of her this is all I have it's from the sheriff's poster and I thought that's it's a picture of abject poverty where you don't even have photos it's mm-hmm. not like they're walking around with cell phone cameras also this was two thousand and five but. But 
the prevalence of you'd have to take get a camera, put the ca- mm-hmm. film in it, take a photo or take a video. And to think that now your daughter who's, you know, you've lived 30 years with her, you've loved her for 30 years, and now she's gone. You don't have a recording of her voice. Yeah. You don't even have a photo of her except for yeah. her driver's license picture off the sheriff's reward sign mm-hmm. was it crushed me. It is. Yeah. No, it's it's super heartbreaking. Two years later, on March 18, 2007, the body of 21-year-old Kristen Gary Lopez was found floating in a drainage canal. Kristen had been seen last on March 5th and had been reported missing 10 days later. This time, the victim's body had been dumped further south than Loretta and Ernestine. It appeared Kristen's body had been in the water for much longer than the previous two victims. Her body was severely decomposed and had been subjected to bites from alligators and other marine wildlife, making it necessary to use dental records to identify her body. Kristen also struggled with substance use issues, and toxicology reports showed high levels of drugs and alcohol. And Ethan Brown, who is the investigative reporter that really went down there and spent a lot of time with the families, wrote a big piece for Medium that I think turned into his book, and he Mm -hmm. talked about Kristen being the most vulnerable of the eight victims, the eventual eight victims, because she was intellectually disabled. She received SSI, you know, supplemental Mm -hmm. income checks from the government. She participated in the Special Olympics. And so she, again, you see a person where if you just see in the media, oh, a drug addicted prostitute was, but it's what what I hear is an intellectually disabled adult who was trying to maintain some sort of sense of, you know, independence in a town mm-hmm. where it was hell bent on dragging her down just by circumstances mm-hmm. was then victimized. Mm-hmm. That's a lot different than hearing, oh, just a drug addled prostitute was yeah. killed. It's, this is a person who need, was vulnerable and needed help. And, and very young, 21, mm-hmm. yes. Just, yeah, just 21. Because of their identified substance use problems, alleged sex work, and the fact that all three victims had known each other and had run with the rough crowd, Sheriff Ricky Edwards tried reassuring the public by pointing to the victims' high-risk lifestyles. After coining this phrase, the media picked it up, leading to a deluge of victim-blaming articles written with the intent of calming the fears of taxpayers on the wealthier side of the railroad tracks. And to some of the media's credit, if they're going solely off of what the sheriff said, the sheriff was really driving this narrative of there's nothing to worry about. They did it to themselves. Keep yourself out of these situations. It won't happen to you. It's such victim blaming. It's, well, if you're not doing drugs and out there selling your body like you shouldn't be, then you're not going to, you know, find yourself in a situation where this might happen. Yeah, where maybe. in reality... You should be able to do anything you want as long as it's not a a crime to others without fearing that you're going to get killed for doing that. Yeah. And in some of these cases, the women were rumored to have assisted with investigations, maybe in a Mm -hmm. confidential informant way. So then you're thinking, okay, well, they're by circumstances alone, you know, on the streets and then being taken advantage of by the police. And then this happens. So then they're then it's like they're disposable pawns yeah. in this narcotics trade. Also, I think he he really ran on this platform of like the civil asset forfeiture of like, I'm going to clean up this town. And it really doesn't look like he's doing well as a sheriff if the second year after he was elected as sheriff is when he really started with the civil asset forfeiture issues and ends up on the news like five years later. And so it's just like scandal after scandal under a person who I think wanted to maintain control and say like, I'm the new sheriff in town. Oh, he was beloved by all accounts by the, by the rich people, by the rich side of town. But the other problem is sheriffs are elected officials and they don't answer to anybody except the voters. He was his own boss and didn't have to answer to anybody. So you're calling the shots, you're making the rules You're glad handing with all the people on the north side of the tracks. And he was very well known. He had 10 kids. He was involved in, you know, everything that uh, small town people are involved in and seeing it, you know, all the local high school football games and everything. So the north side loved him and he was elected outright time and time again. The south side, different experience. Sinisterhood will be right back. 
we have to tell you all about an amazing new service we found called FrameBridge. FrameBridge makes it easier and more affordable than ever to frame your favorite things without ever leaving the house. From art prints and posters to the photos sitting on your phone, you can frame bridge just about anything. Here's how it works. Just go to framebridge.com and upload your photo, or they'll send you packaging to safely mail in your physical pieces. Preview your item online in dozens of frame styles and gallery wall layouts. Choose your favorite or get free recommendations from their talented designers. The experts at FrameBridge will custom frame your item and deliver your finished piece directly to your door, ready to hang. Instead of the hundreds you'd pay at a framing store, their prices start at $39 and all shipping is free. Plus, our listeners will get 15% off their first order at FrameBridge.com when they use our code CREEPY. Order online at FrameBridge.com or stop by a FrameBridge store to work with a designer in person if you're in New York, D.C., Atlanta, Philly, Boston, or Chicago. This service could not have come at a more perfect time because I have my wedding photos and I'm so excited to lay them out and figure out what size, you know, get varying sizes, different Mm -hmm. frames, and then set a beautiful gallery wall because I have no photos of Paris and I together. (laughs) I am so bad about printing photos off. I have a million on my phone and I'm terrible about printing them off to know I can just upload them. It's so much easier. Also, I'm very bad about getting things framed. I'll get things printed and then I don't frame it. So if it can all be done in one-stop shopping and just handed to me to then put on my wall, very appreciated. Get started today. Frame your photos or send someone the perfect gift. Go to framebridge.com and use promo code CREEPY to save an additional 15% off your first order. Just go to framebridge.com, promo code CREEPY. Framebridge.com, promo code CREEPY. Now a word from our sponsor, BetterHelp. I was recently talking to folks about journaling and how sometimes I get in a journal or in a negative thought loop. And one of the things that my BetterHelp therapist taught me is about putting things in a universe box where I write it out. And even if I don't have a solution, I can write my problem out and then just say, I know that a higher power universe, whatever you believe in, will help me deal with it. And I use that probably every day. And she taught me that. That's amazing. It can be tough to train your brain to stay in problem solving mode when faced with a challenge in life. When you learn how to find your own solutions, there's no better feeling. A therapist can help you become a better problem solver, making it easier to accomplish your goals, no matter how big or small. You've always been very open about your your therapy journey. And so when I hadn't done talk therapy before, and I found out about BetterHelp, it made it easier for me to, to, to begin. It's something that everyone should be doing. We all go to the doctor. We all go to the dentist. We all do things to, you know, keep ourselves healthy. Our brain, that controls everything. Mm -hmm. So what more important thing to keep healthy than that? If you're thinking of giving therapy a try, BetterHelp is a great option. It's convenient, accessible, affordable, and entirely online. Get matched with a therapist after filling out a brief survey and switch therapists at any time. When you want to be a better problem solver, therapy can get you there. Visit BetterHelp.com slash Sinister today to get 10% off your first month. That's BetterHelp.com slash Sinister. Before anyone could be arrested in the prior murders, a fourth body was discovered in the early hours of May 12, 2007, by a man named Jamie Trahan. 26-year-old Whitney Charlene Dubois' body was found totally nude at the intersection of two country roads, directly in sight of passing traffic. This led investigators to conclude that unlike the previous victims, Whitney was meant to be found. Trahan called 911 around 7.15 a.m. to report his grisly discovery. However, this timeline of events has been called into question by Trahan's former brother-in-law, Chad Richard. Chad told filmmakers of Murder in the Bayou that he was in the car with Trahan earlier in the night when the two of them drove past Whitney's body on the deserted dirt road. According to Chad, they were driving around getting high when all of a sudden Trahan turned onto Bobby Road off Highway 102. Chad recalled in the interview how Trahan made an exceptionally wide turn onto the road, as if he already knew there was going to be something in the road he needed to avoid hitting. When the headlights of the truck passed over Whitney's nude body, Chad claims he told Trahan that there was a body in the middle of the road and that they should stop and help. Allegedly, he ignored his brother-in-law's concerns, telling him it was just a deer. Chad, however, was confident it was a human, telling filmmakers that it was clearly a body because 
you could see it like a sheen of wet. And that's why I knew it wasn't a deer because a deer has hair. This was not a deer. It, it was a shiny body. And that is suspicious. They talk about partying at this uh, hotel together and they get in the car. But it, he said the way you would normally turn, you just, you know, you turn right on mm-hmm. the road. But that he really angled like a big turn in an effort to avoid something. And I think he knew it was there. I think he knew it was there. And he was um, why you would drive by it knowing it's there, perhaps to check to see if anything's happened. If yeah. anyone is has stumbled upon it or, you know, or to make sure that the victim was really dead. Mm-hmm. Um, but you definitely, you can picture in your head headlights on a deserted dirt road shining on a naked body lying in the road and how it would be shiny and bright white and pale. It wouldn't look anything like a deer. You would definitely be able to tell the difference. And her sisters told interviewers that it she was in kind of a fetal position mm-hmm. on her side. So it would have been a wide swath of, and it was, she was not decomposed like the other victim. Mm-hmm. So it would be a wide swath of her skin that, like Chad said, you can tell the difference between something that has fur and something that doesn't. And yeah. this is a human. Yes. From his jail cell on charges unrelated to the murder, Trahan spoke out about the allegations from his ex-brother-in-law. He said that after dropping Chad off, he drove back down Bobby Road and confirmed that it was a body, not a deer. Fearing he would get in trouble over the drugs in the car, he said he didn't immediately stop. Rather, he went home, dropped the drugs off, picked up his girlfriend, and drove back to the location of Whitney's body. Trahan said he then called it into authorities around 7.15 a.m. Like other victims, Whitney struggled with substance use issues, but was beloved by her family. She was mom to a four-year-old daughter named Beyonce. Whitney delivered Beyonce via an emergency C-section. The incision site had gotten infected, leading doctors to prescribe Whitney pain pills. According to her family, Whitney was soon unable to function without pain medication. Two days before her murder... She was seen partying in a man named Billy Connor's camper. Billy's camper was known around town as a party spot, specifically if you were a woman in need of drugs. And her two sisters also said that she, Whitney had a fight with her boyfriend the night she went missing. Mm-hmm. She went to her grandmother's house. The There was some question of whether she could stay or go. They fed her. The grandma fed her some chicken and gravy. And later autopsy reports showed that that was still in her stomach. So mm-hmm. it wasn't that many hours later that she was killed and that she stole some pills from her grandmother's house and then left and went to Billy's Uncle Billy's camper where everybody would kind of hang out and party, and it was parked on his his half-brother's land, and that folks saw her there in the camper. Now, those in the camper said, oh, well, she got him left, and she walked down the street. She walked down this deserted street by herself, which her family said that's unlikely. If she was going over the the camper to party, she would have stayed there or Mm -hmm. gone home. She would not have just walked down into the darkness. Yeah, this camper is a um, a den of seedy and criminal activity, by all accounts. Yeah, just known to go there. It was very well known that if you were female and didn't have money to get drugs, there were things you could do with this camper, and they would give you drugs. So it was, everyone that's talked about it says it was just a swinging door. People were in and out all the time, all hours of the night, and... You didn't feel safe there, but you went there to get drugs. Yeah. Billy's daughter, Hannah Connor, told filmmakers of Murder in the Bayou that many of the girls that were murdered were known to hang out at her dad's camper. According to Hannah, her dad had a sexual relationship with Kristen Lopez, even though young Kristen called him Uncle Billy. Hannah had no problem with her dad and Kristen's relationship and also partied at the camper, regularly smoking crack with her dad. That was a repeated uh, pattern we saw in many of these instances was parents, not all parents, but he certainly Kristen was, or not Kristen, I'm sorry, Hannah was pretty open that, oh yeah, we smoked crack together. Yeah, and the interviewer even asks, did you think that was weird? And she says, yeah, yeah, I did. I mean, it's not lost on her that it's not um, a typical way that you spend time with your family. But even several of the victims' parents that were interviewed said that, you know, they eventually started smoking crack with their daughter too. And uh, one in particular said, you know, people would ask me, why don't you tell her to stop? And I said, well, it's 
hard for one crackhead to tell another crackhead you shouldn't do that when she sees that I'm doing it. So you see just this pattern of systemic poverty and drug use and these just dangerous cycles that they haven't been able to get out of in this small town due to to various reasons. And it just keeps repeating itself and getting worse and worse with each generation. It's almost like you're responsible for self-governing the community is because there are not resources to reach out and help people. And, and the cops they're... don't care. They're just no. like, whatever, y'all are on the, the y'all are circling the drain, you know, then in the herd, we'll just let you do whatever you do. And eventually maybe you'll all die off and we won't even have a South side. No, well, they're like, what can we get out of you too? Of like, mm-hmm. Oh, we can make you sell money, sell drugs for us and keep some of the money. Or we can use you as confidential informants and arrest other people. Or how can we, use you yeah. sexually we'll see coming up with a law enforcement official who had sexual relationships with some of these women and in jail out free and so you, it's like d- they're a disposable resource for m- higher power people whether it's wealthier people or power via th- having their positions in law enforcement and it was this this camper and then the Boudreaux Inn which was like these two places where it was just almost like a a lawless zone like it was like mm-hmm. a, a zone Anything where it was goes. yeah there's gambling there's drinking there's alcohol or not alcohol there's drugs there's prostitution and it's just that's just what happens there yeah. and there's not it's not like okay we're gonna go do a bust well because there's some sort of a relationship whether it's sexual informant or financial with these things so you don't want to bust them and another thing with like police informants is Usually the cops are like, hey, you give us this information, we're going to keep you safe and stuff. There was none of that. No. A lot of times, too, with it, it's they give them money and stuff. Well, the money, you know, is going to fund their drug habits. So they're perpetuating the issue and the -hmm. the rampant drug problem in their own city. Correct. For their own personal gain. Yeah. And when – and there was a a phrase they used – and I've watched at this point. I've watched so much footage, but when you know when the cops bust this drug trafficker right on the highway, and they take a big stash and they put it on the table, and they all stand around it and take photos. One of uh, the people that I believe it was Ethan Brown talked to said, "Oh yeah, the stuff on the table does not stay on the table, and it does not go to the evidence locker. That mm. it's going either to be used to trade for confidential informants, like straight up just giving them drugs, or." giving them to a local dealer who then that dealer deals and then pays back law yeah. enforcement are the allegations of people that live in this town. Everybody's in bed together. That's what it seems like. But only one side of it is truly benefiting. Oh, yeah. I know. It's just manipulation. and mm-hmm. yeah. Located next door to the home of Billy lived his half-brother, Frankie Richard, a local pimp and drug dealer who Whitney Dubois' niece described in an interview with Investigation Discovery as a... No good creep. It was well known around town that Richard was not someone you wanted to cross. Like Billy Connor, Chad Richard told filmmakers that Jamie Trahan also worked closely with Richard. Chad believes that Trahan had dumped Whitney's body on Bobby Road prior to the two of them driving past her. And that's one of the theories is that they, that Trahan was one of many of Frankie Richard's Minions. Men, hands yeah. on men, that he had people that would kind of, that maybe Frankie Richard wasn't dumping bodies, but that he had people that he could. He was ordering hits, or you walk into his camper and somebody's OD'd or had been beaten to death, and then he's like, I need you to take care of this. And yeah, you see all the the guns lying around and the drugs, and you know what a loose cannon he is, and I imagine you're you say, all right, I'm going to go do that. Another of the allegations was that the two gentlemen, Lawrence Nixon and Byron Chad Jones, who'd been arrested for Ernestine's murder, were hands-on men for mm-hmm. Frankie Richard as well. Yeah, he is – oh, I mean, Chatty. he has he has since passed, but yes. um, in Murder in the Bayou, he was still alive. And the interviews with him, god damn. I mean, he's in his mid-60s, but you're still like, this guy's scary as shit. I wouldn't cross him. So then when he's in his, like, 40s – yeah. And able-bodied and, you know, I mean, the way he speaks about women is just disgusting, like they're nothing. Mm-hmm. He just, I, I've sold a lot of things, but nothing I, that I didn't sell as good as pussy. And he just keeps, it's just yeah. like, God, the way he speaks, it's as if you're just in a discount bin at Walmart. You're nothing. You're not a person. He does have a bizarre pride in his work. 
that he yeah. said, if them girls would have been with me, none of this would have happened. To, f- let's start that out. He denies all connection. I mean, he's like, oh, I partied with them. Yeah, I slept with almost all of them. Yeah, I He says with they them. were like his family, that yes. his own family took care of them growing up, which is true. But he would broker the sex transaction. Oh, yes, he's open about that. And he said, that. I made sure they were safe. If, if they had been with me, I w- none of this would have happened. I would always make sure if they had any issues, they would get paid. They mm-hmm. would never get hit. They never did anything they didn't want to do. I mean, he really tries to paint himself as this like altruistic. Mm-hmm. He goes, I'm not a pimp. I just sold pussy for money and kept a part of it. It's like that's just the definition. I think dictionary. that's what a pimp is. Yeah, that is. Yeah, like but by he definition. is a chatty, chatty guy. I mean, was a chatty guy. I mean, just. Well, he's also hopped up on every drug under the sun. I mean, he's slurring his words and rough, you barely understand him in half of it. But yeah, he does have a weird pride. But he he's also you know he just stares right at the interviewer and he's like. I loved Kristen. She was like a little sister to me. I would have, ne- and you're just like, well, you, had you sex would have turned on her in a dime and slit her throat had she crossed you. Anyone, your own, your own kin. Well, and it's weird too because he goes, the police, the police wanted me to give him some of my money for all my drug dealing, and I'm not going to do that. I worked hard for that money. So then now you're like, <laughs> just, I mean, yeah. he's loose lips. <laughs> it, and well, I think that's a testament to. He knows how the town works. He knows oh, yeah. he can be loose lips about it because the cops know what he does and aren't doing shit. In fact, no. he's in bed with them. So it's like, why should I try to hide what I'm doing? I'm. He doesn't even think there's a problem with it. No, I think he felt pretty untouchable and suspiciously anytime he would get uh, in trouble for things like solicitation or possession, he would just get out of jail within mm-hmm. I don't know, five days, 10 days a week, two weeks. So there is somebody doesn't isn't that Teflon, right? Unless there's a connection right. where you're just like, none of the charges stick. On May 24th, 2007, police arrested a woman named Tracy Gilroy, who identified herself as the girlfriend of victim number three, Kristen Lopez. Tracy had driven Kristen's mom to file the missing persons report and allegedly knew at the time the location of Kristen's body. Police charged her with accessory after the fact. Then, according to Tracy, began pressuring her to name two suspects in Kristen's murder, Frankie Richard and his niece slash goddaughter, Hannah Connor. The day before she was murdered, Kristen and Tracy had been partying with Frankie in a room at the Budget Inn. Tracy told detectives that she had seen Frankie Richard beat Kristen because she refused to perform oral sex on him. Additionally, Tracy said she witnessed Hannah Connor hold Kristen's head underwater as punishment during this same incident. Because of Tracy's statements and the two suspects' connections to Kristen, Frankie and Hannah were arrested on May 15, 2007, and charged with Kristen's murder. Then, suddenly, Tracy Gilroy recanted her statements, saying that she had made the story up after being pressured by the police into naming a suspect. With no further evidence against either Frankie Richard or Hannah, the pair was released after spending just 10 days in jail. All along, they both denied all charges. The interview with Tracy in Murder on the Bayou, is post her recanting her statements. She seems very nervous, very on edge. When the interviewer asks, why did you tell them that? I made it up. I made it up. I didn't see anything. I don't know what I'm talking about. I They, they were just hounding me, and I wanted them to stop. It seems to me as if somebody got to her and said, you want to stick around? Then you better re recant everything you just said and here's the story you're going to go with and now she is 100 percent sticking to that story yeah you're right when she said uh they go why'd you say that well i was pressured which is fair i mean they charged her with accessory after the fact but dropped those charges when she was willing to name frankie richard and and uh hannah connor but the story that she told pretty much didn't I mean, it was still the same similar story of what happened of that they were punching Kristen, that Frankie Richard got aggressive, punched her a bunch. And then Hannah was there and and helped and, you know, worked it with him for his part. Frankie Richard said, oh, no, I was with her. I was with Tracy and Kristen the night you know, before Kristen's murder. But, you know, we were hanging out in a hotel room. Kristen and Tracy were stealing from me. And I said, okay, well, it's time for y'all to go. I don't want y'all back in my room. And she said, oh, come on, can't we stay? And he said, no, you know, y'all don't have no respect. You want to steal everything. So y'all got to get out of here. And then he 
kicked him out of the hotel room is his version of events. Mm -hmm. And he said, again, this like bizarre hero that he's Mm -hmm. made himself in. He's like, if she, if I wouldn't have kicked him out, if I just would have let her stay, none of this would have happened. I can't believe none of this would have happened. Like he almost wants to be viewed as a a sympathetic figure, a savior to these girls. Altruistic. Yeah. Mm -hmm. A year later, yet another body was found on May 29th, 2008. The body of 23-year-old Lacanya Chantel Muggy Brown was found face down on a back road around 3 a.m. during an officer's routine patrol. She had been missing for two days prior. Described by her mom as nice, sweet, loved her family and her child. Muggy was beloved by her family. They They tried warning her to take care since other women she knew had gone missing. She assured them she would be okay but also asked her mother whether they would care for her young son should anything happen to her. Her mom agreed. Muggy's older sister later told reporters that Muggy was worried in the days leading up to her death, saying, She knew her time had come. That's something that you see a lot with these women, too, is their loved ones or friends saying in the weeks and days leading up to their death that their behavior changed a lot. They... You know, if they walked to the store or to um, a bar or something together, they'd constantly be be looking over their shoulders, just seemed real nervous. Uh, So it seemed like a lot of them were extra paranoid in the days and weeks leading up to their disappearances because they either saw something or had been told that something was going to happen to them. A lot of it, I mean, drugs make you paranoid. The types of drugs they were doing make you paranoid. But I think it went beyond that. And they knew that, like her sister said, that she knew her time had come, that somebody had told her that you're not going to be around much longer. And it was almost like they were trying to say goodbye versus even to just saying, well, something happened to my friends. So therefore, it could happen to me. Mm -hmm. It was almost specific. And the last time that her family saw her was three days before she died. And Muggy told her grandma, you know, I love you. I would do anything for you. I'd do anything for my son. I love you all so much. And they said, oh, it was really sweet. But it was kind of out of character. And it almost seemed like a goodbye. Yeah. Versus just, oh, I love you. Have a good day. See, It was like, you know, I love you. And whatever I'm doing, it's, you know, and another witness had told investigators later, you know, she had mentioned, I think, I think some police officers might want to kill me. Yeah. And, you know, specifically naming it like that. It's, it's hard for a family to see their friends that happening to their friends or, you know, not even in some cases, friends, cousins, associates, and knowing they all run in the same crowd and saying, don't go out there, you know, be careful. Mm -hmm. And it's like, oh, I'll be fine. But if anything happens, I love you. Yeah. Muggy's injuries were similar to Ernestine. Her throat had been cut. In total, she had seven cuts to her neck and three cuts behind her right ear. Toxicology showed cocaine and alcohol in her system. She had been severely beaten. Her assailants had poured bleach on her face and rolled her up in a red carpet. At the time of her funeral, police told reporters that they were looking into the lifestyles of all victims and assured the public, We're not closing any doors. We're keeping our options open. Still, no arrests were made. Like many Southside residents, Lacanya's family suspected that the local police knew more about their loved one's death than they were letting on. In Murder on the Bayou, Lacanya's sister questioned why an officer was even on the stretch of road where her sister was found at such an early hour. Like several of the other victims, Lacanya's family was not allowed to see her body. They were told that bleach had been poured on her face and that she had been rolled in a carpet prior to being dumped. This raised another red flag for the victim's sister, seeing as how parts of Lacanya's flesh had been found on the ground and birds had picked at her face. Definitely something in a lot of these cases where police say, oh, well, we for your own yeah. safety, we don't want you to see it, or for your own mental health, we don't want you to see it. But Gail Brown, one of, her, one of Muggy's other sisters, said, before she passed away, Muggy said, I'm investigating a murder with a police officer. He's going to give me $500 to tell him what I know happened, and I'm going to cooperate with them. And that, given her behavior just right before she left, and then the police refusing to let her see the body, has led them to think there's some sort of law enforcement involvement. Mm-hmm. And if you've been wrapped up in a rug, how are birds and things getting at your face? And if you were wrapped up prior to being dumped, then how is there part of you on the ground? Just when you start 
looking at the whole picture and it doesn't add up. And then, you know, things like while she was working with this cop, of course, you're going to put two and two together. Yeah. And Terry Guillory coming in and, you know, saying you have these police officers that we'll see that are coming to the family with information that maybe does not match what they know about their loved ones and going, well, why now is there's two narratives. There seems to be what we've seen with our eyes of, like you said, the manner that her body was found. And then the, what's been tell, told in the media and told to the family. Sinisterhood. We'll be right back. That essay you definitely started weeks before the deadline and not the night before may be easier with some late night snacks. DoorDash can help you get the snacks and energy drinks you need to get through that all nighter. Get the back-to-school savings you really want and get unlimited free DoorDash delivery with DashPass, just $4.99 a month for students. How worth it? So worth it. With $0 delivery fees, exclusive items, and more than 25,000 members-only offers nationwide, DashPass by DoorDash has everything you need to make this semester memorable. DashPass for students gets you delivery in an hour or less, so you can satisfy those spur-of-the-moment cravings. Or save even more with 5% DoorDash credits back on pickup orders. DashPass for Students gives you access to more than just your favorite restaurants, saving you on grocery runs, convenience store trips, and they even have your back when gift shopping. And you can save even more with an annual membership, less than $50 a year for unlimited $0 delivery fees. For a limited time, our listeners can get 50% off when you spend $12 or more on your first DoorDash order when you download the DoorDash app and enter code SINISTER. That's 50% off, up to a $15 value, on your first order when you download the DoorDash app and enter code SINISTER. Don't forget, that's code SINISTER for 50% off your first order with DoorDash. Subject to change, terms apply. Before you book any brunch, you pour over lists and lists of reviews, so why not do the same when you're booking a doctor's appointment? With ZocDoc, you can see real, verified patient reviews to help find the right doctor in your network and in your neighborhood. After all, finding the right doctor is just as, if not more important, than finding the right plate of Eggs Benedict. We both have used ZocDoc, and if you want a great doctor, you should too. Get primary care, specialist, whatever you need. ZocDoc is a free app that shows you doctors who are patient-reviewed, take your insurance, and are available when you need them. How easy is that? You don't have to call around to a bunch of places asking if they take your insurance. You just download an app and you know immediately. That search for an in-network doctor oh, is was worst. before ZocDoc. Yeah. You can find any specialist under the sun on ZocDoc. Whether you're trying to straighten your teeth, fix an achy back, get that mole checked out, or anything else, ZocDoc has you covered. ZocDoc's mobile app is as easy as ordering a ride to a restaurant or getting delivery to your house. Search, find, and book doctors with a few taps. Find and review local doctors. Read verified patient reviews from real people who made real appointments. Now, when you walk into that doctor's office, you're all set to see someone in your network who gets you. Go to ZocDoc.com. Find the doctor that's right for you and book an appointment, in person or remotely, that works for your schedule. Every month, millions of people use ZocDoc, and we are two of them. It's our go-to whenever we need to find and book a quality doctor. Go to ZocDoc.com slash creepy and download the ZocDoc app for free. Then start your search for a top-rated doctor today. Many are available within 24 hours. That's Z-O-C-D-O-C dot com slash creepy. ZocDoc.com slash creepy. With so many victims and no suspect, the community began asking whether a serial killer may be to blame. Sheriff Edwards refused to label the perpetrator as such, instead opting for the dismissive moniker, Serial Dumper, suggesting that perhaps the women simply overdosed and their bodies were dumped. This offended many of the families, especially given repeated references to the women's high-risk lifestyles. These terms both diminished the value of the victims' lives. Those in town wondered whether a single killer was to blame or if a larger conspiracy was afoot. Law enforcement refused to confirm or deny, which only fueled the rumors. Understandably, residents of South Jennings were on edge, worried that they, or a loved one, would be the next victim. In Murder in the Bayou, a resident named Sonia summed up the fears of the small town. We didn't let our kids walk to the grocery store anymore. We didn't let our kids ride around the block on their bicycles anymore. It got to where you don't trust anyone because you don't know if, if the person sitting next to you was a serial killer. On September 11, 2008, hunters found skeletal remains in a brushy area. At first, they believed it was a coyote. But when they recognized the skull as human, they called the police. 
It would take weeks to identify the remains as those of 24-year-old Crystal Shea Benoit Zeno. However, her family was suspicious as the day of the discovery. A law enforcement officer named Terry Gilroy had come by to tell them that the body belonged to Crystal. According to Murder in the Bayou, Terry claimed he recognized a specific tattoo on her back. But given the severity of the decomposition, that claim would be impossible. Again, because Crystal struggled with addiction and dealt drugs for one of the local dealers, the community was not rallying to find her killer. Reporter Scott Lewis described the lack of emotion at the time, telling filmmakers, It felt like it didn't mean much at all. I really like Scott Lewis and just the way he speaks of the women and his coverage on it. He co- We'll talk about him more in the second episode because he covered the story up to a point where he was told some things that kind of broke him. And it's very sad to to hear him discuss it. But he was one of the few that wasn't directly related to these women that really was like, this story is not being told correctly. These There's something, we don't a serial killer, just corruption, whatever is going on. But these women didn't just overdose and then happen to find themselves in a canal Even if that's the case, who dumped them there? Someone should be responsible for that. But a lot of them had visible assault wounds. So, you know, I mean, like, they're just leaving out all of these details to just, oh, it's it probably they just OD'd somewhere and then they got dumped there. But, you know, it's because their lifestyle. So don't worry about it. If you're not if you don't have a drug problem, then you don't need to worry about this. Yeah, and you're right. He said, I, when I came to the town, I thought I'd be reporting on, like, Rotary Club meetings. And mm-hmm. then suddenly all these murders start happening. And he said, I wanted to dig deeper and try to interview people. But then, too, you have folks that are wary of reporters. Some families really did want their story out there. He um, definitely speaks, like, with the empathy of a person who watched it unfold and mm-hmm. watched all this pain unfold in front of him. And you're right, the details that were conveniently left out by police, you know, he would try to dig it up and talk about it and received pushback. Um, Mm -hmm. And with Crystal, you know, it was her when she was found that a gentleman named Russell Carrier had found had said, oh, I saw three people coming out of the woods, that area of the woods before the body was found, you know, kind of like it could possibly have been the people at the very least, the people that dumped her, you know, if it was Mm -hmm. these three hands on men working for someone else. And then before anything could be done with that tip, he was killed by a train. Uh, He was uh, basically car was parked on the tracks and was killed by a train. And everyone in his family said he would never have done that. He would never Mm -hmm. have. That was such a shocking. Most wouldn't. Yeah, Why would and you they park said, your car on a train track unless you were trying to die by suicide. But they said that he would have had no reason to do that. It was so bizarre. But it's almost like any time there was these little pieces of evidence that I mean, he named the three per- the three people he saw coming out of the woods. It's a small town. He's like, oh, it's mm-hmm. A, B, and C. I know them. I can identify them. And it's like you were seen. He was identified. Yeah. They've got to get rid of him. So mm-hmm. anytime you, the family too, it must feel like just these waves of of despair because you think, oh, finally someone came forward with a tip that mm-hmm. could help us, and now that person has been killed. And when a cop shows up and says, I'm sorry, it's your loved one, and then tells you they know that because of an identifiable tattoo, but you know that the body was so decomposed that there's no way that that could have even, the tattoo was visible, that doesn't add up. How did this cop know that that was in fact her before like any dental records or anything like that had come back? That's exactly why the parents went. At first you say, oh, my gosh, they notified us. Thank you, Terry Guillory, for notifying me. But then when you find out, there's literally no way for his version of the story Mm -hmm. to be true. Similar to Muggy Brown. Well, you can't see her. We can't show you her body. Well, why? Mm, It'll upset you too much. But when in reality, there's maybe some knowledge that they're not wanting to share. And Terry Guillory, we we will get into him, I believe, in part two. But... He had a sexual relationship with Loretta Chasson, the first victim, and was a warden in the jail, in the local sheriff's department jail. So when these women would go in and out of the system, he would he was familiar with them. Loretta, mm-hmm. he would give her rides back from the jail back to her house. And some one of the other residents said, I've been in jail plenty of times and nobody's given me a ride home. Mm. So he had these kind of ongoing mm-hmm. underlying relationships with all of them. 
Crystal was last seen on August 29th, two weeks before her body was discovered. She made a phone call at a local Phillips 66 gas station to the local sheriff's office, according to her mother, and planned to give the authorities information on the murders of the other women. After that call, men in a silver Silverado Chevy truck came and picked Crystal up. She was not seen alive again. And this truck will come into play more in the second episode. Basically, it uh, was purchased by a police officer from a known associate of Frankie Richard and had been conveniently cleaned and and wiped down and all sorts of stuff um, after it was seen, known that Crystal was picked up in it. Yeah, and it's the reaction that we see to even when there is discovered corruption is a lot of like, well, it shouldn't have happened. But anyway... Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. He's going to keep his job, though. You're yeah, like, well, we oh. know that, yeah, that probably wasn't good. But um, anyways, on to the Rotary Club news. Yeah. Well, yeah, it's like they, uh, the outrage that one should expect to see from upper level management of law enforcement, like, oh, that should never have happened. It's, it's kind of like, well, things happen here and there. You know, it's a small town, whatever, versus you really responding. And also this Phillips 66 gas station is in this kind of tri-corner area where there we have a gas station, a family dollar, and where it was a uh, almost like Grand Central Station where mm-hmm. you'd go, use the payphone, get picked up, buy cigarettes or whatever. And that lot was kind of not watched by law enforcement, but known by people in the city of like, you could go here to this is where yeah. pick up and be picked up. Yeah. 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 I think it boils down to these women are all considered um, trash. Like they are not a value to society and that they're expendable. So if they're just, if they go missing, if they get killed, it's easier for these people to wash their hands of it and their conscience because they're like, well, they weren't really anything anyways. Yeah. And also with some of their relationships with their families, they wouldn't talk for five or six weeks or you know, mm-hmm. five days to 10 days to two weeks at a time ago. Oh, well, she might have gone to another town or she might be hanging out with friends and we'll catch, you know, I'll catch up with her in a couple of weeks. It's her birthday or whatever versus we're about to see you with another victim. But for the previous victims, the first six victims, they hadn't really, you know, it would be not uncommon for them to go some time without talking to their Mm -hmm. family. And so then you have officers go, well, don't follow a missing persons report, whatever. Well, and they know that, too. So it's like, well, I'm going to have some lead time to get my story straight or, you know, because this isn't this won't raise any flags right away. And also they just continuously fall back on, well, she was involved in a lot of drugs and sex work, so you can't be surprised that this is what happened. That's what happens when you get tangled up with that kind of stuff. On November 2nd, 2008, a 17-year-old Brittany Gary walked five blocks to a local family dollar to purchase minutes for her cell phone during the afternoon. Her mother was nervous, giving the string of unsolved murders, and told her daughter to be back in 30 minutes or less. When Brittany didn't return in 30 minutes, Her mother began calling her phone, then the police, knowing immediately something was wrong. Soon, Teresa Gary, Brittany's mom, was leading the charge to find her daughter, speaking to the local news, leading search parties, and putting up hundreds of flyers. Teresa refused to sit idly by and wait for authorities to step in. It was on the second weekend of searching that Brittany's body was found. Based on the level of decomposition, she had been killed shortly after going missing, for the first time, police had a timeline to work from. And Brittany Gary is Kristen Gary Lopez's cousin. So now you're having, you know, you it's down to the familial blood connection. They all knew each other. All yeah. the victims knew each other, which other investigators have pointed out with serial killers. That's very uncommon. Yes. That all of the victims, they might have a similar look about them, like Ted Bundy, you know, and but... All of these victims knew each other, and in fact, a lot of them were related, and they all hung out with the same people and ran in the same circles and everything. So that's really unusual for a serial killer to have killed a bunch of women that all happen to know each other and that all live in the same town in a relatively, you know, I mean, I guess over the course of however many years it was. But even the sheriff said... This isn't someone that's just coming into town and leaving. This is someone that is driving the streets every day, going to the same grocery stores, 
knows these people, is blending in, Mm -hmm. and it's like, well, that's one of the first things you've said that I agree with. Yes. Well, because, and it's a good point because they said everybody here knows everybody else. So if it was Mm -hmm. just a random guy trying to roll into the camper or the hotel and say, oh, I, I, can I have fun here too? They'd be like, who are you? Where are you from? You know, it would Mm -hmm. be very obvious who this person was. Absolutely. Yeah. Teresa Gary is a absolute warrior. Her whole story made me just sob. Oh my gosh. The, uh, watching her and then, they do an interview with the preacher that did her funeral service. Oh, yeah. And the preacher said he was the only one in town that would perform the funeral services because there were rumors that she had been involved in sex work. So none of the churches wanted to touch her and said, you know, she was a sinner and didn't want anything to do with it. And he said, that's not at all what's going to happen. Jesus and God loves everybody. We're doing this. And then in the they have footage of the funeral, and he is just giving it to law enforcement, saying this should have never happened. This little girl shouldn't be up here. Y'all should be doing your job. But he says, and I felt this even before he said it, the grief on that woman's face. And like he said, I've done a lot of funerals, but I've never seen a mom this tore up. And she is just... I mean, the the pain is palpable through the screen of how devastated she is over the loss of her daughter, especially because she, it was the seventh victim. She knew it was, you know what I mean? You know it's, it's out greatest there. Fear, yeah. But you're like, well, I can't keep them under lock and key 24 hours a day. She's going to be gone 30 minutes. I know where she's going. And that's how quick it was. And when you zoom out, the, there's a zoom out. I, it might be in the investigation discovery room. But w- anyway, one of the footage, it shows where the family dollar is and where their house is. And it is truly mm-hmm. not far. Like five at blocks. All. Yeah. It is not far at all. But the surveillance footage of her in the family dollar shows Brittany Gary looking over her shoulder. She's face on with the checker. And then the door, the open door is to her left. And she turns and looks and she kind of looks down and starts looking nervous. And her mom says, you know, this is the last footage we have of her. Mm -hmm. And I hate that I see that she's scared and nervous and that she clearly saw something in that parking lot that made her worried to go outside to walk home. And it's across the street from the Phillips 66 where, you know, Crystal was last seen, too. Mm -hmm. So it's this... Like you said, though, what are you going to do? It's She has to go to the store. You know, she said she really needed minutes for her cell phone. It was yeah. so close. But she kept, she kept going in later interviews. Why did I let her go? Why? Did, and it's like, that's not, you didn't do this. The, yeah. the perpetrator did this. Yeah. Based on the outcry of the victim's families, in December of 2008, after seven women had been brutally slain, Sheriff Ricky Edwards finally formed a task force consisting of other local law enforcement state-level authorities, and the FBI. At the task force, the victims' families expressed outrage. Whitney Dubois' sister called out the sheriff for failing to contact her family in over two years. Muggy Brown's sister, Kendra, challenged the authorities on their inaction. Warning. Y'all need to get to the bottom of this before something happens again. Unfortunately, on August 19, 2009, Kendra's prediction came true when another body was found. So what do we think? There uh, is a significant lack of response on law enforcement because I think it's real hard to point out a suspect when it's you. I feel like law enforcement is definitely to blame, but I also think Frankie Richard is definitely to blame. I think they were all working together and the cops knew that he was... At maybe not killing all of them by his own hand, but was there when they died, knew more about it, had somebody else kill them, or it th- had somebody dump their bodies after he had killed them. But the cops also get a lot of money because of all the drug dealing he's doing, and he knows a lot of the cops' secrets. You know, if the cops are having relations with the women that he is pimping out, then do you want to piss off the guy that can, you know, I mean, I don't know. I th- I think everyone was in bed together financially, uh, drug wise. And it's such a tangled web that how do you, I don't think one person is responsible. I think it's a, it's several people that are all responsible for this. I think so. And I think it's, you're right that it's not one single serial killer. Although, very convenient and a very great red herring to 
put that in the media of Ricky Edwards, the sheriff, going, well, we're not ruling it out because it could be a serial killer. But when you look at the profiling of it, it's not. It's Mm -hmm. (laughs) because it's all different. Uh, And why did it take seven women before you decide to get the FBI involved or to form a task force? I wonder if there was – well, we have to wait until – this person is gone and can no longer assist the task force or this evidence has been sold off and bleached out and destroyed Mm. or this or the family has caused such a stir that Mm -hmm. like all right we got to do something at some point because now even the people on the north side are starting to talk about it and their kids are worried so now we'll we'll do something about it or make it look like we are at least maybe just to to yeah maybe quell as many fears as you can if they start going well this is every year it's at least two and it was uh the solve rate the homicide solve rate of course this is zero percent But they had other homicides at this time, and the solve rate was like single digits. It was just abysmally Mm. low. Uh, Yeah, I think you're right. It's Everybody was connected, and it's one of those where I think if you know something, you know, everybody has a little bit of piece of the puzzle, but no one wants to come forward because they've seen, especially if you're a vulnerable woman, you see if Muggy Brown told her family, listen, I have information on one of my friend's murders. I'm going to do the right thing, step up and say something, and then she ends up dead then anyone that comes after her would say, well, I'm sure not saying anything. Hell yeah, I'd be terrified too. I'd keep my mouth shut. I mean, snitches get stitches is basically what it kind of boils down to. But then even if you're like, all right, well, I'm going to risk it and do what? Go to the cops who are also involved, it seems. So it was a lose-lose situation all the way around. Yeah, everybody's hands were tied. I think the... Really, but the, I think the problem is jurisdictionally you have to call in the FBI, but really the FBI, it, this is a, I think this rises to the level that the Justice Department, I'm frankly shocked that the Justice Department has not done a full investigation mm-hmm. given the significant amount of drug running that goes on through there of like, mm-hmm. wouldn't you, don't, isn't that their whole, there's a whole division of the DOJ that they investigate local law enforcement corruption because you know it. It's so embedded and entangled locally that that's never going to fix itself. It's not like, well, Ricky Edwards will lose his reelection and then everything will be solved. It's like, no, that's not how it's going to work. Yeah. I mean, it's very similar to Murdoch and similar to Murdoch. It's a small southern town where one person kind of runs the show and everybody knows that. And everybody's okay with that as long as they're on the right side of it. But... It all starts to crumble inevitably, and then it really starts to crumble for such this, you know, insidious, they're all in bed together, when outsiders start to hear about it. And the articles, uh, the New York Times did like a small article, and that's where Ethan heard about it first and then dove deeper and wrote a huge uh, blog on Medium about it. And then that gets optioned for a Showtime series. Still, though... Nothing's really being done. So the more spotlight that can be put on this, maybe it'll pressure higher ups to do something about it finally. Because like you said, a full scale investigation for several reasons should be launched. And as I was searching for, obviously everybody's got similar last names, searching for information in this case, murders that have happened after 2009 have had me go, huh, Oh, that person randomly, like you said, was on a train track and got hit. Yeah. Or that person randomly had, a, you know, fell off of a high bridge or something. And in my head, mm-hmm. I'm like, I think they might have known something. Not to yeah. sound too conspiratorial, but when you start looking at everybody yeah. that was related and how they end up, which is bad, arrested for stuff that maybe they did do, maybe they didn't do, but they weren't getting arrested because they didn't know anything before. And now it's like, oh, you know something, lock him up. Don't let him out. He's He knows too much. And time and time again... The residents of South Jennings say it's corrupt here. The police are completely corrupt. They don't consider us as, you know, actual citizens. We're just trash. We're expendable. And they're right. That is what the cops, how the cops treat them. So if you have the police that that know that they can get away with all of this in a super small town, I don't think it's conspiratorial to say, well, you know what? I think uh, old such and such might just, he uh, might take a trip up to that bridge. And Mm -hmm. then if we never see him again, that's okay. No one's going to come 
calling for him. Yeah, if you call Frankie Richard and say, you know, we need this person to take a long walk, a long walk off a short pier or mm-hmm. whatever, he gets it, you know, or say, hey, we've yeah. got a little issue at this mm-hmm. address. Can you send some of your guys over? So then, you know, even if they're not doing it, but the when you even start to zoom a little bit out of Jennings law enforcement, then we're at Jefferson Davis parish, which there's some questions on and I'm not, and there's one or two police officers that actually feel bad for that look like they've been the the ones that are given interviews. I'm like, Oh, they've been kept out of the loop and that's why they're being allowed Mm. to give interviews because I think they can say with a straight face, I actually, I have no information on all that. It's like, yeah, I wonder if you go, okay, we're going to have this wall where we don't give that guy the information so he can with a straight face, go talk to, you know, the, the news or whoever. Credible and honest. And sound credible. Yeah, for real. Well, we'll get into all that more corruption, national media attention and where everybody is now. uh, And yeah. And Various theories and suspects as to who or whom can uh, be held accountable for all of this. We love providing Sinisterhood to you at no cost. So if you like what you hear, consider supporting the show by donating to our Patreon. We're a small operation, creating this show for you by researching, writing, recording, and producing it ourselves. Any amount is sincerely appreciated and helps offset the cost of making and hosting the show. As a thank you, you'll also get some sweet perks like ad-free episodes, a Sinisterhood sticker, membership to our exclusive Patreon Facebook group for those in ruling the airwaves and getting into a tier, a special shout-out on the show, a monthly bonus mini-sode. For September, our mini-sode is on the AI digital cryptid Loab, and patron-exclusive video and audio content like Am I the Asshole, Relationship Advice, Judge Christie, Dear Sinister, True Crime Headlines, which we have a True Crime Headlines discussing Sherry Papini's sentencing as well as a huge Dallas case that's recently come out coming for you soon Uh, so keep your ears peeled for that and so much more and if you're in the getting into it tier you can vote on a bonus content segment each month that you could see us live stream head to Crowdcast or our Patreon and we're tomorrow night Thursday September 29th at 8pm we're going to do something totally different that we've never done before yes voting is underway right now so you can go vote on Three fun ones. There's um, there's one in the lead, but barely. So we'll see which one takes off. You also have the fun perk of access to our Discord server, where you can connect with other fans in real time and discuss the latest in true crime, share personal ghost stories, or just post adorable pictures of your pets. We hop on occasionally, and we host monthly Q&As on Crowdcast, where you can ask us all your burning questions. For patrons not in the U.S., you have the option to pay in pounds or euros, saving you the cost of the conversion fee. Annual memberships for all tiers are also now available, and those that select this will be rewarded with a free month of membership. For more details on all of this and specific member tiers, visit Sinisterhood.com and click Patreon on the top banner. And make sure you stick around after our sign-offs to hear your shout-out. So many of you have been tagging us in pictures of you sporting your sweet Sinisterhood merch. Keep those pictures coming. If you want to get some cool Sinisterhood swag like t-shirts, mugs, totes, and even clothes for your kiddos, visit Sinisterhood.com and click Shop on the top banner. The best thing you can do to help us grow is like, review, and follow on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen to your podcasts. And please tell a friend who you think would like us to check us out. You can also share any episode by clicking the three dots in the top right corner and share topic-based playlists from Spotify by visiting Sinisterhood.com slash playlist. All of this means so much to us and really helps podcasts like us get more exposure. You can follow us on Instagram and Twitter at Sinisterhood Pod, like us on Facebook at Sinisterhood, and follow us on YouTube and TikTok at Sinisterhood Podcast. Christy, where are you at online? I'm on Instagram at Christy M. Wallace and on TikTok and Twitter at Christy or GTFO. Heather? I'm on Twitter at MCK versus the world and on TikTok and Instagram at Heather versus the world. As always, the devil rules the airwaves. Keep it creepy. Hey, everybody. Thank you so much for supporting the show on Patreon. Here are your special Patreon shout-outs. Lauren Guidas. Adobe Queen. Whitney Rail. Nicole Veach. Anya Yogalik. Landy Elledge. Veronica Zykowitz. Chelsea Vickery. Sherry Parsonage. Kate Dunn. Anna Beresford. Neon Cannon. Becky Kotnick. Maya Berkey. Jordan Baker. Kim Beckett. Wilma Fingerdoo. Thank you so much for all your support. We could not do this without you. We sincerely appreciate it. We hope we pronounced your names correctly. Stay safe, stay healthy, and keep it creepy.
sinister